Spectre, this is Mirame, and we are back for episode five of the Pretty Spooky podcast. Five, we've done five of these already. It That's feels a- like more because of the postmortems that we like decided to start doing, which I I love honestly. I think it's perfect. It's exciting. Five is speaking a solid of, number. Speaking of, I guess like maybe we'll just say it now. Um, not next week, but the week afterwards, we're going to do a special edition instead of the post-mortem, uh, which will be a in-depth discussion of our two favorite horror movies, which neither of us had seen each other's prior to this. So we're watching them, and then we're going to discuss them. Now, you said not next week, but the week before. By the oh, time By the time this airs, it will be one week from... One week from the airing of this episode, right? Yeah, that's right. That's yep. right. We we just recorded the postmortem. I'm a little confused. So let, me re- <laughs> let me just re-say it. Sure. Um, so next week, instead of doing the postmortem episode, we will be exchanging each other's favorite horror films, which neither of us have seen prior, and we're going to discuss them. The two films are Suspiria and Martyrs. And it would be awesome if you would watch those movies and then listen to that podcast. Yep. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be fun. We're excited. We've been Very planning much. it for a little while. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that you, you guys will enjoy it as much as we do. So. Yeah. I hope um, so, too. But otherwise, if not, we're going to have fun doing it. So <laughs> well, We're going to have fun doing it, but I feel like both of those are movies that like are uh, very good discussion fodder. They are, and I feel like they're both popular. Like, they're both cult classics. Mm-hmm. And I think even if they weren't, like, between the two of us, since we're talking about our favorite thing, like, we would have enough to talk about to, like... Also, they're both sell. foreign. Yeah, you're right. Italian and French. Okay. Like an excellent point. Okay, we'll save it for the podcast. What do you have this week? Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and disclaim that this is maybe a little long, so I'm already sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry before I do it. Just now. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm always sorry. Let's, you know, start right at the beginning. Um, so I, a couple weeks, oh gosh, it was like maybe closer to a month ago now. Um, I went on vacation with, uh, Pulp Added, who is another ominous glitch person, uh, we've mentioned before. Um, and we go on, like, a family vacation to uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina every year. And I kind of was looking for some inspiration from the, like, Outer Banks area uh, for something cool and, like, regional and spooky to bring to the podcast. Um, you know, I'm originally from North Carolina, not from the Outer Banks. I'm from the western part. But a lot of the stories that you hear when you first, you know, you look up, like, North Carolina ghosts, North Carolina weird stuff... Um, Maybe it's just because I'm from there, but they all felt, like, stale to me. Like, right. they, all, they all felt like well-treaded territory. So I looked a little bit harder um, and found something that I had not heard of before that I thought was really interesting. So um, I'm going to start this out in, like, I guess I'll do it, like, in three parts. So I'm going to tell you guys kind of, like, the legend, like, the story. Um, I'm going to tell you... Uh, about a television program that I watched um, about the subject. And then I'm going to fill you in with a, like, very well-researched historical book uh, with the facts. Um, And I think, there, you know, I'll leave it up to you to make your own decision on what you think the truth is. So this is really funny, and I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to hijack anything. But my topic and the format of my topic is like really, really goes hand in hand. 
Oh my god, that's so funny. It's also like a travel spooky thing. We didn't plan this, you guys. We did not plan it. This is and it was a place that I've traveled. Like, and it's all like my personal story about it and then the legend and it's like, yeah. Travelogue so. episode. Yeah, travel episode. <laughs> so, um, I guess what I'm about to tell you guys is we're going to cover the the murder and ghost of Nell Cropsey. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so I want to start with the legend, um, which I compiled this from three different sources. Um, the majority of it I took from an article called Dead Women Do Tell Tales, The Lingering Ghost of Nell Cropsey, which is from AmericanHauntingsInc.com. Uh, I and K. rad title. The title or the website? The, is that, is that the name of the website? Dead Ameri- Women Do Tell Tales? Oh no, that's the name of the article. Yeah, that's a good name. I like it. Yeah. And that's on AmericanHauntingsInc.com. Um, I'm going to link to all of the stuff in the blog post that accompanies this, so don't worry about it. You can find it there. Um, I also fleshed it out a little bit where I found where I found a legend, a piece of the legend that, like, differed slightly, but I saw it in multiple places. Uh, I went and, like, filled it in. So uh, I tried to hit all of the most repeated parts of this legend, um, even if they varied a little bit from story to story. Uh, the other two articles that I mainly drew from was, one was called The Ghost of Nell Cropsey, which was on NorthCarolinaGhosts.com, and there's a blog called Seeks Ghosts on Blogspot uh, that had an article called The Death of Ella Maud Cropsey. So, <laughs> on the night of November 20th, 1901, a young North Carolina woman named Nell Cropsey vanished from her family's home in Elizabeth City. After a frantic search that lasted more than a month, Nell's body was discovered floating in a nearby river. She had been brutally murdered, but by who? Her lover spent more than a dozen years in jail proclaiming his innocence before being pardoned by the governor. Did he kill Nell? And if not, then who did? And why did he commit suicide soon after getting out of prison? The story of Nell Cropsey remains one of the strange tales of murder in the state's history and perhaps the unanswered questions that still surround the case and the reason why Nell are still surround the case are the reason why Nell's ghost still haunts her family home today. Nell Maud Cropsey was born in July 1882. Her parents, William and his wife Mary Louise, lived in Brooklyn, New York, but in 1898 left the city for the southern community of Elizabeth City, North Carolina. They moved onto a 65-acre farm, and William became a judge in Pasquotank County. They happily settled into their new home, and Nell and her younger sister Olive became quite well known in the area. They were both beautiful girls and had more than their share of suitors. Olive began a relationship with a man named Roy Crawford, while Nell was courted by Jim Wilcox, the son of the local sheriff. By 1901, they had been together nearly two years and were talking about marriage. Um, Other sources state that they had been courting for nearly three years, um, and uh, said that Nell was growing impatient with Jim Wilcox's hesitancy to propose marriage, uh, and began flirting with other men in public to attempt to spurn him into proposing. Oh, shit. Uh, this is a pretty crazy drama. There's so much drama. Um, on the evening of November 20th, both Roy and Jim visited the Cropsey home. The two couples spent the evening together, and at around 11 p.m., Jim stood up and asked Nell to join him on the front porch to talk. Um, they, some sources say that out on the porch, they were fighting. Uh, it was a loud fight. Everyone in the household could hear the two lovers yelling at one another, uh, even if what they were saying couldn't be understood. Um, some of Nell's family who were in the house at the time did say that she and Wilcox had tentatively made up by the end of the evening, but no one ever learned exactly where the lovers stood at the end of the night. Um, everyone else in the house, except for Olive and Roy, were asleep. Uh, a half hour passed, and Olive assumed that Nell had come back into the house and gone to bed. Uh, Roy Crawford left the house and didn't see anyone outside. Um, one account states that uh, after she'd gone to bed, Ollie heard something bang against the back of the house shortly after Jim had left. Um, and going out to investigate, she found that the screen door had been broken. Um, she saw no sign of who or what had broken the door. Uh, when she returned to the room that she shared with her sister, she saw, she saw that Nell was not in her bed. She assumed Nell was still with Jim and went to sleep. Uh, what happened next is where the accounts vary the most so, um, around midnight, the Cropsey's dogs suddenly began barking loudly. The entire household was awakened, 
and went out onto the front porch to see the cause of the disturbance. There was no one there, but at that point, Olive realized that Nell had never come to bed. So her sister was missing. Or, um, a slight variation, they say that a neighbor woke the entire house, not a, not a dog. Uh, the neighbor was yelling that someone was trying to steal the family's pig. So, same thing, the entire family rushed downstairs where they found the front door hanging wide open, and they realized that Nell wasn't there. Um, they say that uh, Jim Wilcox's umbrella, which had been a gift from Nell, was standing inside the door, uh, but no one had noticed it there earlier that night. Uh, so, Mrs. Cropsey, Nell's mother, was terrified, uh, but her husband tried to calm her down, suggesting that perhaps Nell and Jim had decided to elope. They'd been talking about marriage, and it wasn't unusual for young couples to run off and get married. So he's just, you know, was trying to chill her out. Uh, but by morning, he's not convinced that his daughter had run away. Um, Nell had been excited about an upcoming trip to New York, and none of her belongings were missing, her clothing and suitcases were still in the closet, so he was sure something was wrong. Um, he went to the home of Sheriff Wilcox to ask some questions, since Jim had been the last one to see Nell that night. Uh, maybe he'd have an idea of where she might be. Um, so when he arrived at that, when he arrived there, Jim was home, but refused to come to the parlor and speak with Nell's father. So, angry and alarmed, William went to see the chief of police. The authorities forced Jim Wilcox to return to the Cropsey home, and they questioned him for hours. Despite pleas from Mary and Olive, Jim refused to tell them anything. All he would say is that he had left Nell crying on the porch after about a 10-minute conversation. He refused to say why the young woman was crying, what the conversation was about, or where she, where he had gone after he left the Cropsey home. A massive hunt for Nell Cropsey began. Law enforcement officers, volunteers, and trained bloodhounds combed the area searching, for the, forest, searching the forest and swamps. There was no sign of the missing girl. Rumors began to surface that painted an ugly picture of the relationship between Nell and Jim Wilcox. Friends told the police about terrible fights and Nell's fear of Jim's violent temper. They had been fighting more than usual over the last couple of months, and Mary Cropsey told the police that Nell had recently confided that she was planning to stop seeing Jim. Weeks passed with still no trace of the missing girl. Jim Wilcox still refused to talk to the police, and the Cropsey's family, the Cropsey family began to fear the worst. Then, on December 27th, Nell's body was found floating in the Pasquotank River. Um, one website stated that it was actually Mrs. Cropsey who spotted the body, um, that she kind of had kept a vigil looking out from her, like, window, like an upper floor window, and she's the one who saw something out in the water and alerted people to go investigate it. Um, so she was the first, maybe the first person to see her daughter's body. Um, okay. Strangely enough, the river had been searched many times without success, causing many to surmise that the killer had recently taken the girl's body from a hiding place and dumped it into the water. With no other suspects, Jim Wilcox was arrested, uh, when he was arrested for murder, he stated he had broken off the relationship with her, giving back a keepsake photo he had kept with her, and left her standing on the porch at around 11 p.m. crying her eyes out. He told local police chief, the local police chief that he had joined a friend at a bar for a beer after leaving the Cropsey home. The sheriff stated his son had been home abed since midnight. The chief did not believe him, uh, one reason being that the photo Wilcox claimed to have returned to Nell um, was not found. Um, another reason... And another reason discovered later was that an empty bottle of whiskey had been found on the riverbank near where the body was found. Uh, and a local clerk stated he had sold a similar bottle to Wilcox on the day of the disappearance. While in jail, death threats poured into the police station, promising that Jim would be lynched for his crime. To make matters worse, he still refused to account for his whereabouts in the house after Nell disappeared. The autopsy showed that Nell had been killed by a violent blow to the left temple. Jim's temper was said to be violent. Could an argument have turned deadly? Uh, in a strange twist, the family received an anonymous note a few months later, uh, or wait, sorry, a one month later in December uh, that stated a witness had seen Nell go to the back of the house to discover someone trying to steal the pigs. The pigs again. Um, she was then knocked unconscious, and the witness stated he saw this man put her in a boat and row away. Uh, the letter had a New York postmark and included a map which marked the spot where the body could be found. Uh, and the spot marked on the map was very close to where Nell body, Nell's body was eventually discovered. Who sent the letter, and if the events or accounts are what truly happened that night, remain unknown to this day. Um, during the search for Nell, a psychic got involved in the case, uh, and she stated that she had seen Nell's body being thrown down a well, um, which is something that kind of distracted searchers for a while. Um, but anyway, uh, Jim waived his right to a preliminary hearing and went straight to trial. 
In March 1902, he was found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to hang. Uh, before he could go to the gallows, his case was declared a mistrial by the North Carolina Supreme Court, and he was tried again for murder in 1903, and this time he was found guilty of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to spend the next 30 years in prison. In 1918, though, Jim received a visit from Governor Thomas Walter Bickett, and a short time later, he was pardoned and released. After Jim got out of prison, he found himself ostracized by the community. He could not find work and began to drink. He met with famed newspaper editor W.O. Sanders, who was planning a book about the Cropsey case. Uh, whatever Jim had to tell him was apparently so shocking that Sanders made immediate plans to start on the proposed book, but it was never to be. A short time after the meeting, Jim committed suicide with a shotgun blast to the head, and Saunders was killed in a car accident. <clears throat> so whatever Jim Wilcox told him at that meeting will never be known. Um, however, it's just one of the mysteries connected to this case. Tragedy continued to follow the Cropsey family. Supposedly, Nell's mother Mary lost her mind and died in an asylum. Her sister Ollie became a recluse, and one of Nell's brothers, William Jr., committed suicide by ingesting poison in 1913. Uh... In uh, Roy Crawford, Ollie's former suitor, also committed suicide in 1908. Um, it was whispered at the time that he did this out of guilt. You know, the rumor, people, again, more rumors, people rumored that he found Jim Wilcox standing over Nell's body and helped him move the body to the river. Uh, we'll likely never know what happened to Nell the night in 1901, and perhaps this is the reason why her spirit refuses to rest. For the past century, those who have lived in the former Cropsey home have reported strange occurrences. Lights go on and off, doors open and shut, water rushes from the sink even when no one turns the handle, and strange gusts of cold air waft through the house without explanation. Some reports also include sightings of a pale young woman who has been seen walking across empty rooms. People passing by on the street have seen the same pale figure looking wistfully from an upstairs window, um, and one resident claimed to recognize Nell when she awoke and saw the murdered girl standing at the foot of her bed one night. Um... Some witnesses have also stated they saw her ghost walking along the riverbank where her body was found. Will the enduring mystery of Nell's death ever be solved? All of these years, it seems, after all these years, it seems unlikely, which means that the unfortunate young woman is just as unlikely to find peace, that find the peace that she still seeks. Her lingering presence reminds us that she never truly received the justice that she deserved, and because she still walks, she's never forgotten. Her sad story is told over and over as we recall the tragic tale of her ghost. Dead men, or in this case, dead young women, really do tell tales. Wow. So, that, There's a lot going on there. There is. There's a lot. Um, and what's what, what's weird to me is, like, given all the stuff that I'm into, like, and being from North Carolina, that, like, this was never a, a thing that had entered my periphery before. Um, yeah. But I, it's, you know, it immediately grabbed my attention. It's, you know, a really young person who, like, died too soon, like, mysterious, like, circumstances surrounding kind of everything um so i as i was looking up more information about the legends and specifically about the haunting stuff um it came to my attention <laughs> that like six years ago maybe more um the travel channel show dead files came to elizabeth city and did an episode on the house uh which is called seven pines uh which is the home that the cropsey family was living in at the time uh, the episode, if anyone wants to go watch it, is called A Watery Grave. Um, on the Travel Channel website, they listed as Season 1, Episode 11, but if you look it up on Wikipedia, it's Season 2, Episode 5. So if you're trying to hunt it down somewhere, it's one of those two. Um, <laughs> good luck. Yeah, best of luck. Um, I think I had to watch it on, like, Daily Motion or something. Ooh. You are you are glitching out. I see it. Do you think it's Nell, Cro Nell Cropsey's ghost? Maybe. It's kind of creeping me out. I'm going to probably leave it in because it looks so awesome. Rad, rad. Uh, um, I'm going to go through it. Okay, so um, if you're not familiar with the premise of the show, which I wasn't, I have actually never seen Dead Files before, believe it or not. Um, there's a psychic, uh, Amy Allen, and a retired homicide detective from New York named Steve DeShiavi, I think if I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, they go to a location. He conducts interviews and research. Holy crap. It's going insane. Should I stop? Yeah. Let's, like, just quit the call and then come back real quick. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No, you're fine. It was actually cool looking. You can but... send me some cool screenshots of it later. Well, I actually might leave part of it in the video, but I, I don't want to distract from your story. No, that's fine. 
Um, I'll, should I, I'll just restart with the dead files part, I guess, or just. Um, what was the last paragraph that you started reading? Uh, I was saying, uh, if you're not familiar with the premise of the show, then. Okay, yeah, you can start with that. Okay. So, um, if you're not familiar with the premise of the show, which I wasn't, like, shockingly, I had never seen an episode of Dead Files, but, um. If you're not familiar with it, there's a psychic, uh, in this episode it was a woman named Amy Allen, and a retired homicide detective named Steve DeShiavi, who I think is from New York, uh, go to a location, um, he conducts interviews and research about the location, and its history, and the folks involved with it, and all this stuff beforehand, and then later, she goes and does, like, a psychic walkthrough investigation of her own, and then at the end of the episode they get together, um, with their client, like, whoever's called them out there, and they see where their facts corroborate each other. So, in the episode, um, the client is a grad student who has recently moved back to his family home, which is this house, uh, where he often saw and heard things that no one else could explain. Um, and basically, he's still, like, kind of scared to be there and wants to know if it's safe for him and his family to continue living in the house. Um... The majority of the episode, they they didn't spend it 50-50 on in- investigation and, like, paranormal walkthrough. Like, they definitely spent way more time focusing on the investigation part, and I don't know if that's because they didn't get a lot of ghosty stuff. It's not really, like, a ghost hunting show. Like, it really is the woman, like, walking around and giving her impressions a lot. Mm-hmm. Um. Or if it's possibly because, uh, I'm going to say it right out, I think this show is absolute bullshit uh, after all the research that I'd done. I've never seen this show. Well, I've never seen another episode of it, so maybe there are better episodes than this one. But I think by the end of this segment, by the end of this episode of the show, um, I think we can all agree that no matter what you think happened, I think Dead Files like, made a bunch of shit up. So Okay. So... <laughs> burst in bubbles right away. Sorry, no, if you, fine. sorry if you like Dead Files. Anyone out there. Um, yeah. But, so, the majority of the notes that I took on the episode uh, have to deal with the um, investigation that they did. Um, you know, they, according to the people that lived in the house, when he interviewed the people that lived in there, namely the, the kid, Ryan, and his mom, um, he heard a lot of unusual noises, especially when no one else was in the house. Um, and he, he felt particularly singled out, um, and he just, you know, felt very targeted. Uh, he told a story about when he was 15, he woke up suddenly from sleep and saw a young woman in her late teens or early twenties and like a Victorian style dress, but you know, she was kind of hazy and it was like a, a, a misty fog. Um, and he was later in a car accident And after he'd been home for a month or two, he kept having this dream about that woman um, who seemed to, like, acknowledge the accident, but then sort of threatened him and told him that if he didn't help her, that his little brother would be next. And that always, like, really bothered him. Uh, You know, at that time, he started screaming, and, you know, he felt like no sound was coming out, and eventually his mom came into the room, and she talked about remembering, you know, like, 15-year-old boys don't cry and hold their mother Mm -hmm. that way, if, Mm -hmm. you know, if they didn't see something that really, truly scared them, you know, so she, I guess, like, tends to believe him more than not, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, she, she, um, said, here's, okay, here's another thing that I think sounds like bullshit. Uh, They asked, well, like, what else, you know, is there anything else that you've seen? And she said, when we were discussing whether or not to have you guys come in and do the show, like, a pot flew out of the kitchen cabinet. No, it didn't. I don't think it did. That sounds a little too convenient, but okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay, okay, Robin. Um... (laughs) They, uh, you know, they talked to somebody who babysat there a long time ago, uh, and she said, and I thought this, I, I thought this was cool, um, she, you know, back in the, like, late 80s, early 90s, uh, she was at home, she was on the phone, 
there was one phone line. And so she was on the phone talking to somebody, and in another room in the house, she heard the phone ring. And it, like, really creeped her out. And, you know, just pe- they talked to people about things they'd seen. Um, then, uh, he, okay, Steve, our old friend Steve, goes to talk to a woman who, or a woman, a man who, quote, wrote the book on this case. Great. Okay. So this guy... His book came up when I was doing research for this, uh, and it has pretty terrible reviews on Amazon, so I didn't read it. Uh, but this guy, <laughs> I'm, I'm dragging this guy. I'm so sorry. This professor is named Bland Simpson. Make Insert joke here. Uh, yeah. Um, the, for those of you curious, his book is called The Mystery of Beautiful Nell Cropsey. Um, but, like, he's not a professor of history. He's not. What is he a professor of? Creative writing. Oh, fuck. Okay, yeah. All right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, I, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so they, like, talk to this guy as if he's, like, a resource Um, and, and, you know, he honestly doesn't have much to tell you outside that's any different from the legend that I told you before. Mm -hmm. Um, he, the only thing I think that he mentions that's different is he says that Ollie, the sister who was there the night and who, you know, became a recluse and died, uh, he said that she died of colon cancer, which I was not able to verify. Okay. Um, but he says that she died of colon cancer, and that's really the only thing he says that's different. Um, he takes them out to... There's, like, a shed behind the house. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the place where they did an autopsy on her body immediately after they pulled it out of the water. Um, okay. They did an autopsy in the shed behind the house. Um, like you do. Yeah, you know, whatever. I mean, if it's convenient. <laughs> um, so... He pulls out some documents and hands them over, like, as if they were coroner's documents. But I don't know. Um, but he hands over this, like, coroner's report that said she died of a blow to the head and drowning. And he throw he, like, as a throwaway comment, says that there were some people who sus- suspected her own father... Because he was purchasing large amounts of ice at that time. And then, you know, just never mentions it. Um, so there was obviously the theory that she committed suicide because she was so upset, uh, which is what at the time was the defense of Jim Wilcox. Um, it was that, you know, it's possible she committed suicide, or if she was murdered, it could have been, like, literally anybody else. Um, but, but, you know, the the next thing they do is they talk to a forensic pathologist uh, named Dr. Brian O'Reilly. Um, I kind of want to look this guy's credentials up, too, because he does not seem very legit to me. Um, he talks about a glaring mark on the neck. That he thinks isn't, uh, you know, he says there's this mark on the neck in the, you know, autopsy report or whatever. To me, that says strangulation, and it would have broken the hyoid bone and this and the other. And he really gets into it. Um, But I nowhere ever saw any mention of a mark on the neck or strangulation. I just thought it was totally made up and weird. Um, But he thinks she was, she was strangled. Um... Then uh, Steve convenes with a marine scientist named Dr. Rick Lutich. Lutich. I'm not not sure on that one. But he says that he looked up weather records for the time the body was discovered and noticed that several cold fronts came through that would have brought winds that would have sent her body downriver. And he wants to counterpoint to people that think that Nell's body was too well preserved to have been in in the water for 37 days. 
that at that time of year, the marine life would have been dormant and the temperatures would have been very cold. So it's possible that she could have been in the water the whole time. And finally, the last person he talks to is like a local historian of some kind named Marjorie Berry, who kind of wraps it up by kind of glazing over Jim's sentencing and how he was pardoned. Um, she describes Jim as kind of an eccentric guy, uh, talks about Roy Crawford's suicide, William Jr.'s suicide, um, Ollie's being a recluse, and then mentions that she died of colon cancer again. Uh, this entire investigation is interspersed with this psychic, um, I think, like, and what's weird is I think they just, like, cut and pasted whatever parts of this walkthrough were most convenient to whatever part of the investigation they were talking about, because they really don't mm -hmm. seem to be in any sequential order if you're looking at them. But, you know, like, she senses sickness and death before even reaching the location. Um, you know, she feels that really bad things happen here. Um, there are a couple different spirits that she feels. One is a ghost named Charles or Charlie, who she, she thinks is, um, like an older caretaker type that is, is pretty benign and that when they hear weird stuff around the house, it's kind of him banging around kind of a thing. Okay. Um, then there's a, a spirit that is the young woman, which she kind of ages at about 15. Um, with this character, not character, with this ghost, she feels like fighting and unhappiness and almost borderline teen angst. Um, she, there's another spirit that she sees or senses out in the shed where the body was autopsied. Um, she like goes out there and there's a hole in the ceiling and she, you know, seems to be doing her best not to look at it and looks really uncomfortable. And she says, first of all, she can, like, in her mind's eye, I guess, she can see a woman's body laid out on the floor. Um, and sometimes she makes it sound like she can see multiple women, but at least one. And she says that there's, like, a man in the ceiling. There's a man up there, and he's watching her, and he's masturbating to his handiwork and that he's he's a pervert and a sexual predator and he, not only does she believe that it's that whoever that is killed Nell he's killed other people but there's no there's absolutely nothing to support that i'm assuming no not as far as i can tell um but it to be fair it's creepy uh the idea well, of, like, potentially being watched by, like, a m masturbatory oh, yeah. fucking serial killer ghost is, like, sufficiently unsettling for me. Well, yeah, and also, um, <laughs> I, I am a huge Ghost Adventures fan, mm -hmm. and they have literally complained before about how Travel Channel has forced them to do things that were not what they wanted to do, or... Mm -hmm. um, they wanted them to push it further to make it seem like they had more evidence than they actually did. Yeah. That's, that's... So I don't know if it's a similar situation, especially with a show that this is potentially in the first season or second season. Yeah. If there's pressure to do Really outrageous more. stuff. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a really valid point. Because a lot of this sounds, like, too convenient or, like, too much. Too much. It's just too much. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they kind of, they wrap it up with... The uh, Amy does a, a thing where she sits down with, like, a forensic sketch artist and tries to recreate the face of the, like, young woman spirit. So, really, there there's four spirits in total that she... There's, there's Charlie, there's the gross serial killer, there's the young woman who's angry, and then, like, more nebulously, the, what they decide is the ghost of Ollie. Um, just a ghost that... Or a spirit that makes her feel, like, incredibly ill. Um... And she thinks it's the, like, cancer feeling or something. Okay, okay. So, um, they meet with the client. They share all this information with them. He confirms that this drawing does t resemble the ghost that he saw. Except, okay. like, 
I kind of, again, the way that the episode was cut, it almost made it seem like even he wasn't super convinced that the face that she dictated and, like, the sketch artist drew was quite right. Because it kind of, like, cuts to her, like, sort of explaining, like, well, you know, I only saw her, like, from profile, and she kind of just, like, whizzed right past me, so I didn't get a good look at her. So, like, like she's making excuses for the reason that her ghost reconstruction doesn't look great. Okay. But... (laughs) Regardless, the, like, bottom line is that she, she thinks the house is really angry, uh, that, like, something, you know, the house, like, the spirit of the house has been corrupted, um, from evil, and, uh, the, the fact that a spirit kind of threatened this kid and said, you know, if you don't help me, your little brother's next, that doesn't sound like a ghost to her, that sounds like a far more serious presence, um, that's not a spirit. Right. That's, you know, that's more like, I guess, a demon. demonic energy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're like, it, it follows up at the end of the episode with that the kid ended up moving out. So he got the fuck out of there. Um, regardless. I mean, so they say. So they say, yeah. Um, but that's, that's how that investigation went. So that is how the travel channel uh, investigates this particular case. Okay. I'm so sorry this is so long. No, it's fine. So, the last thing is I read an actual book about this. Like, mm-hmm. and it is up to date. This book came out in 2017. Oh, nice. So, it is... It's... To, to the best of my research, uh, it is probably... If you want to say somebody wrote the book on this, it's this guy. Um... The book is called, um, God, I did everything but write down the name of the book. <laughs> it is Nell Cropsey and Jim Wilcox, The Chill of Destiny by William E. Dunstan. Okay. Um, and the book is, is broken up into three parts, um, and he says in the table of contents, like, if you're only interested in this murder case, consider skipping part one. And go to part two and part three. Because part one is almost like him breaking down year by year the, like, sociopolitical climate of um, Elizabeth City in the years leading up to what happened. Both for, I think, like, setting flavor and also, like, setting up how, how people worked in this town. It was still, like, a pretty small town. You saw the same names repeated all the time. Mm hmm So, uh... There, he basically worked off of personal interviews, um, historical documents, newspapers at, from, at the time that recounted things from different perspectives. Um, and there was a strong, like, current of, like, political stuff running through a lot of this. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily say it's enough to have convicted Jim, but I think it's a factor. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that is contrary to not just that Dead Files investigation, but even the, like, legend as it's told. And it paints, like, a pretty different picture to the point that I think it's it's worth mentioning, and, you know. So, uh, in reality, the Cropsies, they, like, weren't this wealthy family from New York. They moved there from New York, um, but they lived there for two or three years as boarders in the home of a wealthy man named John Fearing. Um, Mr. Cropsey was really bad to spread the rumor that he had been a judge previously, back when he lived in New York, because it's easy to hide that at that time. Um, but in reality, he was literally a potato farmer. Um, Okay. But as it were, the whole family had this, like, weird habit of lying about their age. And they, they often made themselves, like, a like, a year to, like, several years younger than they actually were. Um, Nell Cropsey in all the stories is is listed as having been 19 when she died, but she was 20. Um, her sisters all did the same thing, and I think, like, even her parents on their tombstone, like, they the birth date is incorrect uh, because they lied about their ages so much. Why? I do not know. You know, it... The vampires, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> so... Um, 
there were rumors that were, I guess, so well documented that this researcher took them seriously, um, or at least considered them seriously. There were rumors that Nell had developed an infatuation with their landlord, the man that they were living with, uh, Mr. Fearing, who was much older. Um, so the author actually interviewed a source that asked to remain anonymous, um, save for the fact that they were a descendant of the Fearing family, who said it was well known within the family that the Cropsies were prickly and rude, and Nell was very flirtatious. Um, the John Fearing and his wife would always say that, you know, they prayed that the Cropsies would leave their home. Um, but John Fearing was a relentless womanizer who was known about town to brag about his conquests with other women, which his poor wife had to hear about and had to just, like, live with because at that time, divorce obviously isn't an option. Right. Um, but the anonymous source goes on to divulge that Nell and John mutually embark on this romantic fling. Um, and that Nell's relationship with Jim, who, like, by all accounts, it was more or less one-sided. He was, like, kind of smitten with her at first sight. And the whole thing was kind of meant to be a smokescreen, so people didn't notice or realize that she was really seeing this older man who's married. Okay. And that they're living with. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and actually, like, I think at one point her sister will kind of will make a statement that publicly acknowledges, whether she meant to or not, but publicly acknowledges that Nell had a preference for someone other than Jim. Um, so there's kind of this whole vibe that um, political stuff, as far as, like, Democrats and Republicans, um, really, you know, this was, again, like, post... This is a... What was it? Reconstruction era? In, in post-Civil War? In the South? Yes. So yes. there's still a lot, a lot of talk about um, what rights that black people have or don't have. Um, the You know, this is that period of time when Democrats were the, like, incredibly conservative, like, white supremacist party. And every time I had to read about a Republican saying something decent, I kind of had to do a double take because I didn't understand what I just <laughs> read. Um, but the, the Wilcox family was one of the few, like, very staunchly Republican families in the town. Um, previously his father had been the sheriff, um, uh, but he had been out of office for a few years at this point. Um, and the town had risen into being like a mostly democratic place. Um, it was a pretty un inhospitable place to be black or progressive at that time. Um, so Nell, Nell was also a Democrat and she, that was, I think, part of her distaste for Jim. Um, but she seemed to have no problem using him to kind of get stuff. Uh, he mm -hmm. was always showering her with gifts. Um, they were, you know, seen out and about. He was taking her to fairs and to uh, musical events and carnivals and uh, traveling show type things. Like the f this big, you know, fancy automobile is coming into town. Everybody come out and see the automobile. Like, he kind of just took her everywhere and, like, involved her in social engagements and stuff. Um, things that you're... His, his trophy lady. Right. Or things that your your secret boyfriend can't do because mm -hmm. this is your secret boyfriend. So, uh, but after a couple years, um, and, and it seems to line up with about the same time that in the, all the rumors they speculate that um, they started arguing more. Uh, about that time... The family moved out of the Fearing House, and they moved into the house called Seven Pines that she would eventually disappear from. So it seems to me, at least, that she no longer had, like, 24-7 access to this dude that she was seeing on the side and mm -hmm. kind of was lashing out about it. Okay. Um, there's all these accounts about how he or she started to, like, straight up ice him out. Like, she would make plans with him, and he would show up, and then she, she would ignore him the entire time or cancel right on the spot. Um, he occasionally, it was overheard, and he would overhear them, like, shit-talking him behind his back, her and her sisters, or, like, her and her mom. Um, and he, as you would expect, got, like, kind of sick of it. Um, mm -hmm. And she had a cousin that was in town from New York. And he, she seemed, like, not a total piece of shit. 
And he, she talked to him and was like, why does Nell hate you so much? And he said, you know, your guess is as good as mine. And so it was kind of in this spirit of their relationship that the breakup happened where he returned the umbrella and he returned the photo and, you know, kind of told her, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to keep spending money on you and taking you places and trying to do nice things for you if you're just going to treat me badly. So Mm -hmm. this is goodbye. Um, And he left her crying on the porch. Uh, He, contrary to, like, the rumors and that episode, they both claim that, like, Jim wouldn't speak to the police and was really uh, not helpful. But he, like, spoke to the police pretty much right away as soon as they asked him and told him that she was missing. Um, He visited the family with the police and let the family question him and ask him whatever they wanted to know. Um, Whenever he was asked to, like, repeat his story, he, like, never changed a detail. Like, he, but, so he was, like, completely compliant to the police the whole time. But he, like, for some reason, it's, the, the legend is that he wasn't. Uh, I guess maybe they wanted to project that he was hiding something. Uh, the anonymous letters did exist, um, but not the one about, like, not just the one about the the pig. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, she was, she got, you know, taken because she caught somebody trying to steal your pig. There was another letter that uh, was postmarked from Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, um, that stated that she was being held against, that she was being held there, but it kind of implied that she had left of her own free will. Um, both okay. th- that letter, it's speculated, was sent by her dad, who, as this whole thing goes on, it seems like he is less and less worried about what actually happened to Nell and more interested in, like, having a, a big public show. Yeah. Um, so they, something that I thought was interesting was that they did a, they did a complete autopsy on her, um, but the Dead Files episode made this really confusing statement saying she was only autopsied from, like, the neck down, which doesn't make sense if you say that there's, like, a mark on her throat. Yeah. And also, if it seems well known that she died of, With a blow to the head? With a blow to the head. Yeah, I was like, what in, what are you talking about? Um, but they, like, the, the trial, in reality, like, kind of hinged on, uh, whether or not you think Nell died of drowning. Um, so, you know, her body was really well preserved when they found it. Um, and they, you know, it seemed pretty clear that maybe she'd been held somewhere and then dumped. Okay. And, um, they, the the coroner who, like, I'm trying to keep this light, but he, like, had sketchy shit going on himself. Um, but he said that, you know, there's, we did an autopsy, there's no water in the lungs, therefore she died before she was put in the water, Mm -hmm. therefore she was dumped. Uh, and he had, like, a coroner's jury of, like, five other, um, doctors there. And, um, when it came time for trial, two of them did not testify. One, because he said he, he couldn't in all good faith say that she hadn't drowned. Uh, and the other one, um, because of... They, they blocked him, I think. They, I think they knew that when he got on the stand, he was going to say as much. He was going to say the same thing, and they, they blocked him from testifying. But the thing was that, to the best of, like, medical knowledge at the time, and according to medical textbooks that the doctor, like, the coroner himself stated that he used, like, there had been no bodies found after that length of time. So there right. was, I guess there wasn't, like, a precedent for it. And they were concerned that after having... That if she, re- if she really had been in the water for 37 days, that it's possible that, like, water in the lungs could have, like, made its way out or have been, like, absorbed elsewhere into her body. And that, I don't know. They just, like, they didn't feel comfortable testifying that. Okay. So they didn't. Maybe that's something you have more knowledge about because you spent a brief amount of time looking into, like, potentially being a coroner. Yes, but... It's hard to say what the standards were at that time. Right. So, so what what it would probably be much easier for us now to make a clear cut decision on whether or not she drowned. Right. But that but back then it would 
I don't, I'm not really exactly sure what the standards were. Yeah, I, I mean, they, they listed a book, um, but I didn't look it, up the book at all. I mean, I could be wrong, but it does not at all sound right to me that the water would not be in the lungs anymore. It does, if she had drowned. Well, it doesn't sound right to me to suggest that she would have been in the water for 37 days and still be that preserved. Like, they tried to suggest yeah. on the show. Like, yeah, but if the water was icy cold, like they mentioned that right. you said that, yeah, that maybe. I don't know. I guess I just imagine that there would still be some kind of, uh, like, a different kind of decomposition just from, like, constant it, currents or something. It would depend, I guess, on how exactly cold. Yeah, like, Was they the body say. frozen or not? I don't think it was frozen, but then yeah i don't know i don't know it's either. hard to say because we're getting so much different information from so many yeah, different dude. sources on exactly um yeah i don't know uh, water water obviously causes the body to decompose a lot faster yeah i i i tend to think that no matter what the guy who wrote also, in a partial book probably has better facts but also, if she was in the water for that long, that you would be seeing bloating, like, a lot of bloating. Right. You're right. Yeah. That's, mm-hmm. I mean, and they don't, I think they said that, like, I don't specifically remember them mentioning bloating. Um, yeah, that's weird. They said that they knew she got hit by a blow to the head because, like, it was, like, swollen and puffy and, like, gross out warning, sorry, but they, like, sliced it and, like, a hemorrhage like, a big blue-black clot of blood came out. And they're like, all right, that looks like a point of impact to me. Okay, that makes sense, because that, like, swelling you'd think would go down by that time. But. Yeah. Um, so, they do a full autopsy on her, um, mm-hmm. as opposed to what all these other sources seemed to state. Um, they try to have a trial for him. But at this point, her father has kind of whipped everybody up into such a frenzy that he really is in danger of being lynched. Um, he, The father later goes on to tell a story that a lynch mob came to them and wanted wanted him to, to lead them to the courthouse and to the jail and to kill Jim. And he told them no and turned them away. Uh, that, You're right. That turned out to be a lie. He made all of that up. Mm-hmm. Um, so it comes down to... The, like, final days of the trial, they're giving, getting ready to give the verdict. It's, you know, or it's closing arguments. And when they're giving the closing arguments <clears throat> for the defense, like, 300 people walk up and walk out and leave. Um, and they don't stay to listen to the defense art to, like, show, I guess, their um, displeasure. And they also pull, somebody pulls a fake fire alarm. So between a bunch of people, like, having a mass exodus from the courthouse and a fire alarm being pulled, it was, like, extremely distracting for the jury. And yeah. um, there was concern that it influenced their decision. Um, so he goes to jail. He gets sentenced to death. Um, but his defense mounts, or, like, appeals to the Supreme Court that, like, he didn't get a fair trial because people were... Like, the jurors were affected by what happened in the court. So he gets another trial in a different city, um, and that's when they come back with the second-degree murder charge. Um, But, like, even then, like, they're really astonished because there's no actual evidence of anything other than him doing exactly what he said he did. Um, I noticed the, like, bottle of whiskey thing that, like, one source mentioned that they found a bottle of whiskey near the body that, like, matched something that he used to drink. And I couldn't find any mis- mention of a bottle of whiskey having anything to do with the case, except okay. that there was, there was a, he ran into a guy that he knew on the way home who actually ended up being somebody that said, like, yes, I saw him leaving on his way home when he said he was. Uh, and that guy worked on a ship nearby. He had gotten mm-hmm. off the ship to buy a bottle of whiskey for the captain and then went back. But that's the only time anywhere I saw any mention of, like, a whiskey bottle. God, this is so convoluted. I know. I'm so sorry. No, it's not your fault. It's, it, but the like, the long and short of it is he goes to prison. He stays in prison. Uh, there's at one point even a prison break and he doesn't leave because he's like, that would only make me, you know, like, I didn't do anything wrong and that's only going to make me look more guilty if I try to escape. So yeah. he stays in prison. He eventually has a meeting with this 
I guess, governor, and they don't know what's said between the two of them, but it's convincing enough to have him be, like, let go. No questions asked right away. Uh, he does um, struggle with depression after he gets back to society. Um, he never escapes the stigma that he killed this woman, and yeah. um, he did attempt to, like, reach out to that newspaper person, newspaper editor, uh, but it was actually two years before he died, um, and he ended up skipping the appointment. Um, he was disheartened because he knew all anyone wanted him to do was just to admit that he did it, um, and he refused to do that. Um, but he was, however, known to have said to someone who, like, helped care for him in the years leading up to his death, uh, quote, I don't know who killed Nell Cropsey. I only know that I'm as innocent of her death as your baby. But old man Bill Cropsey could tell who killed her if he would, and he may do it before he dies. Um, so he, you know, believed that her father did it. And then the... Or at least he knew who did it. Right. Um, as for the, the rumor that they kind of breeze through in that episode of Dead Files, um... The rumor about her father, Will Cropsey, being under suspicion for having killed his own daughter and preserving her in ice um, due, in, su due to suspicious amounts of ice being ordered to the house. Uh, it turns out the source of that uh, statement um, was the author of this book's own father. Uh, his dad was the one who noticed the discrepancy in the ice being ordered to the house. Wow. Uh, and he, he, like... I guess, like, funny story, but, like, he uh, did a, like, local history project for it when he was in school, and he wanted, he, like, heard about this murder case or whatever, this weird case, and he wanted to, he, like, asked his dad about it, and his dad was like, son, I have something to tell you. I've been keeping this a secret my whole life, and, like, I saw these, like, ice shipments being made, and I knew they were weird, and I it always made me uncomfortable, but at that time, my... Um, my, his mother died, and then I think they had a baby that died, and it was all, like, super close to the time that Nell went missing, and he was so, like, overcome by grief, he never came forward with his suspicions about the ice orders, because he just, like, couldn't handle it. So you think Dad did it? I, I think Dad, well, oh, here's something I didn't tell you. When they had the bloodhounds out, and they had like, a, a piece of her clothing for the bloodhounds to sniff, and they're like, go find her. This is before her body shows up. The bloodhounds ran to a pier nearby, less than half a mile away, that was owned by John Fearing. Ooh. I don't know. I I don't know if I think... The, the author of the book, after he's presented hundreds of pages of documents and evidence and, and stuff, he seems to think, and I tend to agree, that it's possible... He, after, you know, Jim left, um, Nell went to John Fearing for comfort of some kind, maybe, or maybe he was just around, um, but they, he caught his daughter with this older man and, uh, like, hit her, maybe didn't know how hard he hit her or something, and it killed her. And they were, mm. they were both kind of complicit in it at this point, so to save his reputation... And to preserve the other guy of, like, being a murderer, they kind of had to maybe work together. They, you know, kept her body on ice, then dumped her off of his pier. So did I miss this information? Like, how did they afford to go from borders to having this nice house? The, I didn't, I didn't say. Um, so they were borders in, the, the Fearing House was a very nice house, and they were borders there. And then there was another family that the house that they ended up in that was owned by another family and they moved to like Ohio and they decided to not move back to Elizabeth city. And so they were like, we'll just rent this house out. It's whatever. Okay. So I guess they maybe potato business was good and yeah. they were able to afford the potato business for a little, I don't know. I'm not totally sure financially exactly how that went, um, okay. but they were, they were renting the home from a family that like no longer was interested in living there. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of stuff there that uh, is not a part of the legend that I think is really weird and suspicious. Uh, I think it is kind of a shame that it focuses only on Jim, because I mm -hmm. kind of tend to feel like he didn't do it. Um, right. 
But either way, like, I, I just, I was, I became so and engrossed. Also the, the idea of, like, oh, poor, beautiful, no. And then you find out, like, she was kind of a horrible person. Yeah, she wasn't real great. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I just, I, the, I, the more I read and researched about this, the more I became fascinated, not just with the, the legend itself and not just with the real life mystery behind it, but with, like, the way that things were, like, interpreted over time. What, yeah. what facts stuck and what facts were forgotten and, like, you know. No, that was really interesting. That was a good one. Uh, yeah, I I don't know. I just, I would like to, um, next time we go there on vacation, I'd like to try and make a trip out to that house and see if I can check it out. Um, yeah. I did find, <laughs> when I was researching stuff, uh, I found somebody's fan fiction about themselves meeting the ghost of Nell Cropsey and uh, falling in love with her. Ooh. It's not as cool as it sounds. It, it's, uh... I'm maybe, sure it isn't. Um, <laughs> maybe for the postmortem I'll do a dramatic reading. Oh, sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> um, do you have any other okay. questions? Anything I can wrap up for you on that one? No. I feel like I, I may have information overloaded, but... No, I, I wouldn't say overloaded, but I feel like it's not out of the question for me to be thinking about this later and just be like, oh, I need to ask you a question about this. Sure. So, yeah, we'll try to, even though we're doing the special edition next time, if we feel like we need to talk more about this, then we will. Yeah. Uh, I hope all of you guys listening to that long-ass story enjoyed it as much as I did. I enjoyed it. And I, I guess I would also second, if you're really interested in it, um... I did really like that book by uh, Mr. Dunstan. Um, but, again, if you are only interested in the mystery, I can only reiterate what he said. Don't be uh, embarrassed to skip right to the mystery parts. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. Because it's a lot of extra time. But it sounds like it, it paid off for you to learn a little bit about the socio-political climate of the situation. Definitely. I feel like I, I didn't, but I feel like I solved a, a murder here. I feel like I solved a mystery. Yeah, you did. You the did guy that. who wrote this book solved the mystery, but the, like, oh, super, super quick post, post-mortem. Uh, he found out when he was researching writing this book that uh, because Jim had committed suicide, uh, he wasn't allowed a proper burial. So mm-hmm. 80 years later, he, like, raised the money to have a headstone put on his resting place and had, like, a very small service in his honor, Aww. which is I thought was really sweet. That is very nice. Um, okay, I will go into mine. Sure. I, this is going to be, like, the longest episode ever. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, it was a few years ago, I took a trip just to go visit um, my other BFF, Jenny, in Washington State. And we are huge fans of Ghost Adventures, and we were talking about how there was a nearby location that they had gone to, and we looked into how expensive it was going to be to stay there, and it was really reasonable. So we were just like, hey, let's just go take a little trip and go stay at this place. Mm -hmm. So the place is in Port Townsend, Washington, and we took, like, a ferry to get there, and it was pretty cool. Um, and it's called Manresa Castle. Um, can you spell that? Manresa, like M A N R E S A. Okay, okay, got castle. Um, so I will go ahead and just sort of describe the experience, um, we were a little bit surprised because it, it does look like Manresa Castle is not really like a castle. It's a hotel and it's not super big, but it is like a few floors and the outside design is meant to look like a castle, like a European castle. Um, but it's really like basically a small hotel, like compared to what we have now. Um, it was, it's, it's kind of not in the best location, so the views all around it are not great. And we were a little bit surprised when we got there that it was so... It was just, like, this really cool old building just in the middle of, like, trash city. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry if anybody uh, 
is really defensive about that location, but it is, like, literally, you can view a McDonald's, and, like, the our view is, like, of the parking lot and construction, uh. and there's literally, like, a trailer park right behind. But the building itself is really beautiful, and they have this really cool bar, and we spent a lot of time there. <laughs> And they have, like, this really cool entryway. Everything's very old-looking. They've preserved it to keep it looking like, I guess, an updated version of when it was when it was built. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and we wanted to get the haunted room, which I believe is room 306, but it was already taken. And we did end up in a different room, and I cannot at all remember what room it was because it's been a few years. Um, and I asked her, and she also didn't remember but basically there's nothing to do around there so we had dinner at the restaurant which was good and then we just got fairly drunk and um just sort of hung out and we were watching tv and we we eventually decided we were going to go to sleep because we were going to visit my family in olympia the next day except no matter how hard we tried including me taking sleeping pills we could not sleep could not sleep and we're just like laying there watching it's like it felt like this weird hell of time just passing extremely slowly and yeah we had just like crappy tv on and we're just like you know sitting there laying (laughs) laying in bed together because we wanted to save money we got one like a room with one bed and um we both kind of did drift off at a couple different times. And that was when weird stuff sort of started to happen to us. Mm-hmm. The weirdest thing, I guess, is that, you know, you can you can chalk it up to the fact that we had been drinking, but so many hours had passed that we were not really under the influence of alcohol anymore. And we both have a history of having sleep paralysis, but I think it's pretty rare for both of us. And we ended up getting it on the same night. We both had sleep paralysis at different Hmm. times in the night. And we both had this sort of waking dream that we woke up in the exact hotel room. Everything looked the same, except for when I rolled over and looked at her. And in her dream, when she rolled over and looked at me, we were not ourselves. And we both saw a dark-haired woman in bed with us. Mm. And it was really weird. Um, And then I also had a dream that that same dark-haired woman was using scissors to cut the blankets on the bed. Hmm. And after having the initial sleep paralysis where that happened, we both kind of, like, fought to stay awake And in order for me to stay awake, I went to go take a shower. And the bathrooms, which all includes, I'm sure there are pictures of them. It was, like, strangely very large. And there was a door that leads out to the hallway. And it was sort of like a wavy glass so that you could not actually see anything. But if somebody was walking by, you could see it. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was, like... Three or four in the morning, and I saw, like, people walking up and down the hallway. Uh-huh. And I, I just assumed it was, like, other guests. But now I'm just like, what the hell were they doing at three and four o'clock? I don't know. Yeah. But the Good other point. thing that was strange was that when I was taking a shower, like, the shower is here and then the wavy glass window is here. Um, it really, really, really felt like somebody was watching me take a shower. Ooh. And Jenny also... Like, I didn't say this out loud to her, that I felt like somebody was watching me take a shower. And then she was just like, she told me separately, I hate that bathroom. It feels like somebody's watching you. Ah. And so there's, I will get into, like, some of the other experiences once I give context in the history to, like, what those ghost stories are and, like, why we went up to to visit these various parts of the hotel. So I'm just going to scroll through our conversation here earlier just to make sure I didn't forget anything because I I touched base with her about it she was like she just says I had sleep paralysis I uh turned to look at you and it wasn't you and it looks scary as hell um I'm trying to remember more oh there was another presence that felt like a man and it felt like really demon-like is what she said that's not good 
And then, like, I told told you about the scissors. Um, and, like, I didn't like the bathroom at all. It was really bi- big and creeped me out. And I did not feel alone in there. And we were both really upset because it was strange that we both saw, like, a woman in our place in the bed. So that was, like, honestly really weird. And I... I think it I goes, like, like a-, a little beyond really weird. Personally. Yeah, because it seems like something that we would fucking make up. But it... I swear we did not. Um, so let me get back into like Manresa Castle. Manresa Castle from the outside sure does re- resemble a European castle complete with, and sorry, let me start this over by saying all of this information is from like literally hauntedhouses.com slash state slash Washington slash Manresa Castle. Perfect. Um, so. Manresa Castle from the outside sure does resemble a European castle complete with towers, turrets, windows, and an aura of respectability of old world culture. It is an immense building that is three stories and its functionality is well used. It probably takes a boatload of money to keep this wonderful building up to snuff and heated, so they have done a great job putting Manresa Castle to work. The banquet room, which is formerly the chapel, is used for weddings and special events. They have their own restaurant. They host retreats of book book clubs, knitting events, and many other types of retreats that bring people to their lovely hotel. Coming in from the back parking lot, the visitor steps into a large lobby with the old chapel area, now a reception event hall, and it is found on the left down hall. First floor hall has guest rooms that leads to a cafe restaurant located on the far right. The second floor has more guest rooms and the third floor has a different feeling to it. It also has rooms and suites. I got the tingly, dizzy feeling I experience when spirits are around. That's what the author was saying. Okay. Uh, Love the oak paneling and the nice touches of craftsmanship that are visible. Enjoyed the decor and loved the fact that they had information sheets about their hotel. Um, So here's the history. Gutsy progressive entrepreneur Charles Eisenbeis is what I want to say. E-I-S-E-N-B-E-I-S. Immigrated from Prussia and settled in Port Townsend in 1858. He got his future economic success in in business rolling, first by opening up a bakery that provided supplies of bread and crackers to ships and sailors who stopped at Port Townsend to restock their foodstuffs for their next voyage. Business was booming, and with their newly acquired wealth, Charles branched out and invested in other economic opportunities, such as real estate, uh, building new structures in Port Townsend, banks, a brick foundry, and a variety of stores. As Charles became a mover and shaker in Port Townsend, helping create opportunities to grow and thrive, the people elected Charles Eisenbeis to be mayor for three terms. As his business grew, so did his family. Charles married Elizabeth in the fun town of San Francisco in 1865. Charles and Elizabeth had four children. They enjoyed their lives together until Elizabeth died in 1880. Charles remarried Kate in 1882, and they also had four children, creating a huge family of eight children. Just in case you couldn't do math. Too many children. Yeah, way too many children. Um, Kate did well with his large group of children, probably with the help of a nanny or housekeeper. In 1892, Charles was having a temporary cash flow problem because of the hotel he had just constructed in anticipation of the Port Townsend Railroad that was supposed to come to town. This was a business plan that uh, used in up and coming towns with was used uh, in up and coming towns with great success. That plan for Port Townsend train station was scrapped, and Charles was left with a beautiful hotel, but no increased demand for it. Undaunted, Charles went ahead and constructed his dream castle anyway, inspired by the castles in native Prussia. A.S. Whiteway was the designer and builder of the Eisenbeis Castle, a three-story, 30-room masterpiece that had walls that were 12 inches thick. Throughout the castle, handcrafted woodwork and oak paneling was put in place, and three main coal-burning fireplaces kept the rooms toasty warm. Probably more fireplaces were in the castle as well, but many were covered up over the years and haven't been found just yet. Eisenbeis Castle's turrets and towers are very European, giving the structure the aura that Charles was looking for, a pleasant tribute to his home country, Prussia, that he probably missed. The castle was not only the castle not only provided space for his large family, but was the biggest mansion in Port Townsend. In 1902, Charles Eisenbeis died of a Bright's disease, another name for chronic kidney disease. 
Kate remarried in 1905 and moved away, leaving just a caretaker in the Eisenbeis Castle for 20 years. In 1925, a lawyer from Seattle bought Eisenbeis Castle and turned it into a vacation spot for nuns who were teaching in Seattle Catholic schools. It perhaps was an idea that was stifled because of cost and location for his enterprise flopped big time. Mm -hmm. In 1927, Eisenbeis Castle was sold to the Society of Jesus to be a place to educate their last year Jesuit students studying to be priests. The... Priests spent their 16th and final year training here studying ascetic theology. Eisenbeis Castle was renamed Manresa Hall in honor of the birthplace in Spain of the founder of their order, St. Ignatius Loyola. Um, to make his property suit their needs, the Jesuits made some renovations and improvements. The Jesuits installed a $3,400 Otis elevator that is still working today. I took a ride in it. Oh, yeah? Um, mm-hmm. Needing a large chapel and more chapel and more sleeping quarters for their students, the South Wing was built in the back of the main building in 1928 with a finishing touch of stucco exterior. To give Manresa Hall a more uniform look, the original structure also was stuccoed, covering up the bricks. This Jesuit order successfully ran their college here until 1968 when they moved to another site in Seattle because it was too expensive to keep up this old building. Uh, Manresa Hall was successfully sold to entrepreneurs who started the long restoration and renovation process while opening a unique hotel called Manresa Castle. Since 1968, three different owners have had have done their part to restore and renovate this grand building, much to the appreciation of both the guests and the spirit people in residence. Hmm. So, so, here are a variety of possibilities of whom is haunting Manresa Castle. Not everyone agrees on who these spirits could be. People who love their dream homes sometimes return in their afterlife to visit or have an extended stay. Manresa Castle was the dream mansion of Charles Eisenbeis and his family, a magnificent place that he only lived in for 10 years. His wife, Kate, really enjoyed living their life together at Eisenbeis Castle and loved to entertain with flair the upper crust of um, the Port Townsend Society. Um, besides Charles and Kate, others who lived there have all, may have also chosen to visit or stay. Children and others who died unexpectedly from an accident or illness sometimes like to stay in their favorite places in the world especially if their family is still living in the home or perhaps spending their afterlife and parts and parts of it there in spirit form. Lotta Eisenbeis was the granddaughter of Charles Eisenbeis. She, di she died at age 13 of a heart infection. That sounds horrible. Ugh. On March 20th, 1907 in a Seattle hospital. She probably loved her grandparents' castle. If her grandpa was there in spirit form, she probably wanted to stay with him. Obviously extreme speculation. Entity of Father John Alden Murphy, probably an instructor at the college. This was researched by Olympic Peninsula Paranormal Society, who found a 1943 newspaper article that told of his demise from drowning in Puget Sound. Though his body was never found, perhaps his body sunk to the bottom and was pulled out by the strong currents to the sea. His clothes were neatly folded on the shore, suggesting that he was taking a recreation swim in the water on September 2nd, 1943, but had some sort of unexpected, deadly mishap, perhaps some sort of health issue. Father John Alden Murphy's death certificate states that his death was assumed to be accidental. There was no suicide note, and perhaps it was part of his daily or weekly routine to swim in Puget Sound. The following two well-known and well-reported stories about the English female entity Kate and the Jesuit student priest have strongly deni been denied by the present management. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't speak to management, but people who work there seem to believe. Hmm. Um, who claim that these stories were made up by a bartender around eight years ago to explain some considerable activity experienced by numerous guests and staff members. I can see this happening as a means to satisfy the questions from curious folks. However, my sources that reported this side of the story offering offered by the management didn't follow up and ask the name of the bartender. So they could have interviewed this fellow who supposedly made up the ghost stories of woe and tragedy, tragedy. No hotel wants two suicides attached to their business, or perhaps they wanted to play down the fact that they have, uh, 
some mostly unseen spirit people guests enjoying their establishment. Mm -hmm. Though the stories are somewhat plausible, there are stories on hauntedhouses.com of women who find themselves pregnant or just alone who wind up killing themselves because they feel their beloved has abandoned them Mm -hmm. or their beloved is thought to have been killed. Men also have killed themselves over lost love. Story number one, um, as supposedly told by the bartender, a picture of a young woman thought to be English Kate hung up on the wall as of 2008. A young English woman, Kate, came to stay at Manresa Castle in 1921 to wait for her beloved to return from sea. Perhaps she was a relative of the caretaker who stayed at Manresa Castle as the one looking after the place. Uh, Disaster struck when her beloved's ship sunk and it was feared that they had all died aboard. In her great distress, she killed herself by jumping out the window in room 306, mm. not able to cope with uh, with life passing without him. Um, however, it was learned afterward that her beloved had survived and had been, p- been picked up by a passing boat. Mm-mm. Story legend number two. Added twists were revealed or confessed to investigator author Jeff Dwyer by the female spirit thought to be English Kate herself. Hopefully she felt some peace in telling what really happened, if this is indeed true. Because it was such a long time to wait, she became lonely and got tired of waiting. Kate went out to have a good time and inadvertently became pregnant. When Kate was very upset that she had heard her fiancé's ship had sunk, she mourned for weeks. Kate panicked when she learned that he had actually been saved by a passing boat and probably at the same time realized that she was with child. Too ashamed to face her fiancé, she jumped out the window, killing herself on the sidewalk in front of the castle. Shame and guilt suffered because of a big sin or being wrongly accused of something can cause hauntings as well. So that's the same Kate. Yeah, it's just two different stories about Kate. So did you say that one of them was a confession? Supposedly from the ghost. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, if you believe that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've heard about ghosts that knock pots out of out of cabinets on command, just when you know, <laughs> at the mere thought like, of being investigated. Right? They're just like, "Do it! You think you're gonna <laughs> bring a ghost inspector in here in my house?" <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. Here's another legend. All right. A wayward Jesuit priest in training, told by the bartender. This young Jesuit priest in training who may have had emotional issues broke the rules of behavior by having an unsupervised visit with a nun residing in town. (gasps) Scandalous. When called on this after he was caught, he probably experienced some scorn, punishment, and derision. And the threat after the threat of expulsion causing him to become distraught and unhinged. They have accused him. They had, they may have accused him of having carnal relations while he was ta- while he may have just been talking to her as a friend or perhaps he did fall in love with her and they had an intimate relationship mm. and, as he was accused of doing he is said to have hung himself in the attic from the rafters that support the turret right above room 302 while there is no record of a jesuit student hanging himself in the attic this is an event that if happened would probably be kept quiet because there would have been a, that would be a terrible black eye on the Jesuit College, Manresa yeah. Hall, that one of their own committed a cardinal sin on the on their watch in the in the in their building. Though his his death certificate would have been a public document, perhaps they just used his civilian name instead of his church given name. Port Townsend officials were very sensitive about suicide and the embarrassment of the people left behind. Um. There is no record of a Jesuit student hanging himself in the attic. There is a recorded story of another suicide connected to the original Eisenbeis family. Uh, People who committed suicide often find that this desperate act doesn't give them the peace and escape they were expecting. They sometimes try to find peace that they didn't have while while alive in a place that they know and love. Uh, Charles' son, Charles Jr., uh, killed himself in the basement of the Baker Building in Port Townsend on September 29th, 1897. Perhaps his business was failing or some other tragedy he couldn't face pushed him over the ledge of sanity. He probably grew up or spent some time in his beloved family castle. 
And if his father was there in his afterlife, perhaps Charles joined him, afraid to continue onto the other side because of his actions. Hmm. Um, now there's a bunch of, like, <laughs> paranormal findings and stuff. Um, so, uh, I'll get back to my experience and then I'll just, like, maybe gloss over some of their experiences. Um... We went up to the attic, even though you are not supposed to go up to the attic. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Manresa Castle. Like, they were like, you can go if there's a tour happening, but there's no tour happening. And there was this mother and daughter that were there at the same time as we were, and they also really wanted to go to the attic. And so I guess they, like, they went upstairs and they uh, noticed that the door was unlocked. And um, then they, like, came down to the bar and they were like, it's unlocked. We should all go. Oh. So... So, of course, we totally did. And, all right, so this was in November, and it was, like, early November. So I'm not sure if this stuff was just set up, like, for a Halloween tours or if they just, like, tell you not to go up there and they know you're going to. Mm -hmm. And they set this stuff up. So there was, like, a noose hanging from the ceiling. Oh, my God. You, like, you know that they did that intentionally, whether it be for Halloween or not. Uh -huh. But the thing that, like, scared us so badly is there was just, like, a a man sitting down in priest robes in a chair, like, by the window. And it was, like, mostly dark in there. And we were like, oh, my God, what the hell is that? And then the daughter in the in the group was, like way more brave than we were and she like went over and like poked it and she was like it's fake teens so. they're not afraid of anything they're not they're, they're fearless and then also there was just like god i probably shouldn't even be saying this there was like a bunch of um like records of people who had stayed at the hotel and she was just like totally just rummaging through that shit she was just like i don't even give a crap i will just know everything i mean but but it was super creepy up there. I'm sure. Uh, I'm, like, I can post pictures of what the attic looks like, because there you. are yeah. some. I I really want to see pictures of this place. You've described it so, like, vibrantly. Well, I mean, I read other people's descriptions. <laughs> but, okay, so this is, like, the rumored general activity. Okay. Um, doors open and close by themselves. Lights have a mind of their own. Unexplained puffs of air spurt quickly off the shoulders of people walking down the hallways. Uh, in the attic, guests report hearing footsteps walking in the space above the room 302. Uh, sensitives feel an energy president, a presence in the center of the attic. There was an EVP of a male voice caught here saying, I'm not here. Uh, the third floor is said to be haunted, active with paranormal activity. It seems to be a favorite uh, area to tease the living for chuckles. In the rooms on the third floor, guests sometimes have their covers pulled off while they sleep. Uh, or, like, you know, in my experience, cut off. <laughs> um, for a while in room 306, a logbook was left in the room for guests to record their experiences. But when future guests read the experiences of others, they ask for a room change, so, so the logbook was removed. Womp, womp, uh, womp. The female entity of English Kate, or perhaps granddaughter Lotta, uh, as some people... Some of the behavior suggests it's a young girl. She's described as having long, flowing, dark hair, which is what we saw a lady with dark hair uh, wearing a white gown. And uh, perhaps they share space on different levels of existence. Her apparition has been seen standing by the window. The fem This female entity is curious and likes to look at guest belongings that are placed on the dresser and on the floor. She moves them a little, not being too careful to leave these items in the same position that the owner had put them in before leaving the room. Uh, she is also known to leave dresser drawers open. She likes to sing in the bathroom in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, this female entity has created good aromas and bad smells in this room, depending on how she likes the people staying in her room or what mood she finds herself feeling. Hmm. Um... And she has also been known to sit on the bed when guests are in it. Okay. Um, so in the dining room, the entity of Kate Eisenweiss, the wife of Charles Eisenweiss, or perhaps one of the family relatives from Prussia. I thought, wait, so... English Kate and Kate Eisenweiss are two different people. Okay, okay, okay. So there's just two Kates. There's two Kates. Okay, One of them's sorry. the wife, and one of them's just the, the woman who may have killed herself. Okay, I'm clearing that up. 
Um, yeah, I was confused at first as well. Um, a digital photo was taken possibly of her sitting in the dining room in a long Victorian gown, enjoying a memory of a fabulous event. Um, a German relative or employee said that it's perhaps a, like, sh- this, she might be a German relative or employee, that it's perhaps a housekeeper, a nanny, or a nurse. And the EVP of a female ent- entity was, um, recorded speaking in German, um, and it's saying that, like, everything will be okay. Uh, the, all of these EVPs look like they're, they might be linked, so there might be a way to hear them. Uh, um... Suggests that there could be a female entity from either the Eisenbeis or family or Kate's family. So that's like she speaks in German, and that's why you know it's that's maybe why they refer to the other one as English Kate. Okay, that makes sense. Um, it could also be a housekeeper or a nanny or a nurse hired to. Kill. This is a little bit redundant. Um, in the former chapel, now a banquet hall. Uh, perhaps Father Murphy or Charles Eisenbeis isn't too pleased to see his chapel being used as a dining event area. Glasses have been set up on the tables, and they've been found turned upside down. Sometimes glasses shatter, even when being held by a living person. A feeling of being watched closely is sometimes felt by employees. Sensitives and psychics psychics have felt a strong presence in the old Jesuit chapel area. Mm -hmm. As I recall, like, when we went into the chapel area, it was, like, kind of creepy feeling in there. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so then they have their, their findings here. Okay. Uh, many guests and staff members have experienced a variety of paranormal activity, um, so much so that the known haunted rooms had their own ghost journals for people. One of my sources, a small group of amateur investigators claimed that they had made contact, uh, with a male spirit through a Ouija board. Um, the responses they got back suggested that the entity did kill himself because of an inner weakness or evil side. He answered using a Bible verse, suggesting that this could be the student priest or even Charles Jr., who may have been well-read and probably brought up with the Christian religion. Information gotten from the board isn't scientific, but it is interesting. A ghost investigation group has... They're literally called a ghost, like one word. Um... Has a sensitive who felt a strong presence in the chapel area and some chanting as well, and heard some chanting as well. Uh, She also felt a strong energy in the middle of room 302. They had left a camera running in the attic, and the attic caught an orb. I don't know how I feel about orbs, honestly. Um, Investigator and offered uh, Jeff Dyer, I think I said Dwyer earlier, sorry, um, was treated to the full sports package of paranormal activity when he (laughs) deliberately provoked the female spirit by saying Kate, um, oh, who he called Kate getting very angry. He reported that everything, he reported all of the, what he experienced in his book, which I'm like kind of bummed that they might not have posted it here, but Jeff Dyer also caught on digital film of the photo of a stately woman, perhaps Kate Eisenbeis wearing a formal evening gown, sitting at the table in the dining room. This perhaps was residual energy or it could be an intelligent spirit of Kate or one of the other family members. Um, the Olympic Peninsula Paranormal Society did their due diligence in their focused professional investigation conducted on January of 2010. Um, they did hit pay dirt. In total, we had seven DVR cameras running from 5 p.m. until 6 a.m. Total of over 2,000 photos and multiple audio recorders were running along the way. Uh, we had 51 EVP EAPs a couple of personal experiences and some video. All of their hard work paid off as they have been successful in capturing hard evidence of the entities who are living or staying at Minerisa Castle. Uh, they have posted all of these on their website. Okay. I would really um, like to see some of these photos. I definitely... Um, I would if you, too. If you link them on, the, on our... I will. I, I'll put them in our blog post. Cool. Um... Yeah, then also, like, they just have a bunch of pictures of of the place. So, yeah, like, obviously none of that is scientific evidence. It's just, like, a chronicle of maybe creepy ghost things. Not everything has. I mean, that's we're not the science podcast. We are definitely we're the, we're not, not the, the, the pretty, science podcast. We're not the pretty science-y podcast. Somebody else should be, though. Yeah. I encourage somebody else out there to do it. But we are the, like, pretty spooky podcast. I feel like pretty confident I probably, like, misspoke or flubbed up, like, a fair percent of what I read earlier. Um, I always do. Because there was so much of it. 
but uh, we're we're here for the things that we're interested in, right? And I, I don't know, I like that's all really interesting to me. I know, like, there's probably a ton to dig into, but like for starters, I think I'd like to watch the Ghost Adventures episode that you guys saw that like prompted you to want to stay there. Um, I would like generally speaking, just go anywhere that Ghost Adventures has invested. Right. <laughs> um. So, yeah, we just, like, looked up to see um, where they had been. And Manresa Castle was, like, the closest thing. Um, I remember the episode having some evidence in it, but it wasn't, like, crazy over the top. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think, you know, the experience that we had in that room and the fact that we had to, like, do a long drive the next day, and we were so exhausted, but at the same time, we were so, like, when we got up, when we, like, realized that it was, like, an appropriate time to get up and leave, mm-hmm. we were just, like, so pumped on adrenaline that we were, like, we need to leave here. Like, I want to get out of here. Wow. Um, also, like, I have a compulsive, like, when I feel very, very uncomfortable or I can't sleep, um... I've had to, like, work on this, but this is, like, a weird compulsion I have. I just, like, want to take a shower over and over and over and over. Yeah. And so I took a shower three times that night. Wow. I know. It's, like, I sound, like, committable. No, but, no, no. Um, And every time, like, it felt really weird in there. Like, I swear, I, I kept looking to see if there was somebody standing in that, like, wavy window and there wasn't anyone, but I did, like, see occasionally people walking past. But it was, like, really an unreasonable time of night to be out. It was, like, 3 and 4 a.m. I think even I took a shower at 5. So do you think that uh, the woman that you saw was one of the Kates? I have no idea who I think it is. Um, it kind of sounds like when they described the younger girl having, like, long black hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I distinctly remember her having like, long black hair. And that's mm-hmm. how I knew it wasn't Jenny. Because um, at the time, I believe... I can't remember. I know I had black hair at the time, mm-hmm. but my hair was, like, short. And okay. she remembered, She remembered like, that being the reason why she knew it wasn't me. Hmm. Because the hair was, like, long. The scissors are so ominous. Like, that's weird. There's something about cutting sheets that is, like, super creepy to me. Yeah, I remember talking to her about that and i couldn't remember um if she had also experienced that or um like had also a dream about that but she said she didn't have that same dream but you know it It was like you maybe saw like the same person though we definitely saw the same person laying in bed with us it seems like and then um the uh, as far as like the entity like the male entity I mm-hmm. don't know that I really experienced that as much because I feel like most of the things I saw, at least in, like, my waking dreams, were definitely female. But mm-hmm. I can't say that, like, whoever I felt was watching me in the shower wasn't a dude. Yeah. I I feel like uh, to, in most experiences, that's typically a pretty dude thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, also, to, like, not to make too many generalizations, but... I'm, like, looking through these pictures of Manresa Castle, and I don't know why, but this is, like, creeping me out so much. There's just a picture of the inside of a room, and, like, just the sheets and stuff are just, like, all a mess, and there's, like, pillows on the floor and stuff. Huh. And it it just makes me wonder, like, why anyone would take a picture like that. Yeah, that doesn't seem particularly, like, a good way to advertise your hotel. No, this is on the Haunted Houses place, but there's no caption to, like, let you know that that it's from... I don't know. Just weird. Freaking me out. I'm clicking on the a it's ghost thing. Not to, like, um, not to derail this, but I'll keep it short, and it seems related. Um, okay. But I'm sure we told you uh, about a year ago now, like, pretty, if not exactly a year ago now, um, Pulp and I went to uh, check out, like, the Mothman Museum up in West Virginia, and, uh, d- like, in... Point Pleasant, which is, like, you know, the town that's famous for all the Mothman stuff. Um, On their, like, little main street, there's a a hotel that is supposed to be haunted. And I feel bad because I don't remember what it's called. And I, like, obviously didn't come here prepared to talk about it. But we, um, 
when we like checked in, we checked in at like 4 a.m. It took us a really long time to get there and we drove. And we checked in at 4 a.m. and it was the kind of thing where like the people who own the hotel um, and run it, um, oh, it was the Low Hotel, sorry. <laughs> the Low Hotel. Uh, okay. They um, had to come drive into town, unlock the hotel, let us in, and then lock us back in because they don't live there. And they, they, like, get so few guests that they just, like, more or less keep it running on, like, minimum efficiency, I guess, unless they have someone staying there. So the woman who owned the hotel, like, drove out, met us, let us in, um, gave us our keys, and then I presume she left. Um, And we, like, were going up this... We had, like, researched a bunch of... Or read a bunch of ghost stuff about the hotel before, and there's supposed to be, like, a young woman that... um, is in there. Uh, and again, I didn't come prepared to talk about this, so I can't remember all the details. No, that's fine. Um, but, uh, when you are, like, walking up, there's, like, a big open stairway from the check-in desk in the, the, the front hall up to the second floor, and then from there, there are, like, other separate staircases and elevators to get to the third and fourth. Uh, it was also built around that time, I presume. Uh, but we, as we were, like, walking up the stairs and, like, turning the corner, we both heard, like, a female giggle. Uh, no. as, as we were walking past one of the areas that she's um, said to appear, which is the balcony that's directly above the check-in desk. So, um, just, like, not to make this run too long, but yeah. is, this all, is this also the place where you took, like, EVP recordings? No, that's a different place. Okay. Uh, that's one we haven't even, like, checked out our EVPs and see to see, like, what they you, are. We, if we listened to them. Anything. We listened to them a little bit that one time. Oh, did we? Yeah, the this two bottle of wine night. Oh, maybe. Um, but this was uh, well at the same place. Similarly, they have an attic that you're not supposed to go into. And similarly, we definitely like went into that attic because we were curious. Um, and it's clearly like used as a storage space. Probably ninety percent of the time, there were like boxes and Christmas trees and stuff up there. Um, but I think like you can tell that it was meant to be like kind of a ballroom, or like otherwise an event hosting area Mm -hmm. um and it was really pretty and it looked out over the river and you can see the like mothman bridge and stuff from out there but there was music playing really faintly like the entire time we were up there and at first we thought it was coming in from outside um Mm -hmm. it didn't sound like it was from any particular time period it wasn't like it was nondescript classical piano music or anything like that it was just music and i walked over to the windows and i like stuck my head out the window and it didn't sound any quieter or louder for being outside. It was just kind of faint, quiet music. Uh, Not too loud, not too soft. It didn't sound muffled, just quiet. And I, Charles Pulp did not think much of it. um, And he thought it was coming from somewhere else, but I like remained convinced. Like it was, it wasn't clear, but it was like too clear. If that makes sense. It stayed, stayed at a consistent level, no matter where in the, in the, attic that I walked when I checked outside the window when I checked back inside like it didn't change and it really weirded me out yeah that's like a, a, another topic that I'm gonna cover is the Lord Baltimore hotel yeah um also I don't know if these links actually work anymore but I found like the audio like directory of these potential EVPs. Like, I don't know if I click on one, if it's still gonna even work. Hold on, let me check. Ah, I don't want to hear it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they work. Uh, there's, there's a, like, a list of uh, a bunch of EVPs. I can link Perfect. to it. Definitely. We will, we will put a link to this in the blog post accompanying this episode. So, sorry, this was, like, super long travel ghost time. We'll, we'll try but... and edit it out a little bit, I guess, at least. Yeah. But, it, still, I think it was fun. Yeah. Um. Do you have anything else you want to add before we go? I'm, like, kind of bummed that I didn't look at this, uh, the Par- Olympic Peninsula Paranormal Society page more, but I guess if we do a postmortem about it, we can. Yeah, for sure, Definitely. Um, do we want to do a superstition, or are we going to cut it for time? I think we'll skip it this time. That sounds good to me, too. We'll save it for another one. Okay. All right. Thank you guys for sitting tight with us through this episode. Um, 
If you are watching us on YouTube, um, leave us a comment, like and subscribe, um, give us a thumbs up or whatever. Uh, whatever they do on YouTube, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. I don't know. I'm not a child. Um, <laughs> I'm not one of you young people. I don't know how technology works. Um, and if you feel like we did a good job, uh, consider donating to our Ko-Fi. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, SoundCloud. Uh, what else? Pocket Casts? Okay. Pocket Casts. But yeah. also, like, I just feel like we accidentally ended up on a lot like couch or like not couch tuner that's a fucking pirate website Ugh. um we like tune in and a bunch of others we ended up just sort of accidentally on so if you have oh, a, really yeah i think we're, it's just like i don't Maybe really understand how things work but i don't really understand life but <laughs> apparently if you're indexed with like certain major podcast places you get indexed in a lot of smaller podcast places as well so that's if you fine. have a podcast app thing that you really like Check and see if we're on there. And if we're not and you'd like us to be, let us know and we'll try to submit ourselves to that. Yeah, we're um, working on it. If you thought we did a good job, consider donating to our Ko-Fi, which is ko-fi.com slash pretty spooky podcast. Yep. Um, we're not asking for much, you know, but, you know, if you think we did a good job. we Buy us a coffee. Exactly. We do both really love coffee. Yeah, I was drinking it, like, half this episode. At, I made tea. It's, like, really hot here, so I, like, poured a cup of hot water, but I also made myself tea because it's just a habit to have tea while we make the podcast now. And, yeah. You know, it's too hot for it, but I drank it anyway. Yeah. But, uh, all right, you guys, I guess that about wraps it up. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, you want to make a request, we'll try to honor it and just tweet us, uh, Follow us on various places. It's ominous glitch or under, ominous underscore glitch. Uh, mm -hmm. Shouldn't be too hard to find. And we will have all our supplemental links and stuff on the blog. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.